of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. Glory to Christ our Lord. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the company, they went a day's journey. And they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. After three days they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying which he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year to all of you. It's very good to uh, be here with you without all the communion kids, even though I love the communion kids but they have been taking over our Saturday Mass, but it's good to see some of the communion kids' families here still anyways. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So today's Gospel is basically the finding of Jesus in the temple. And so sometimes we could think that it's like basically a story where Jesus is lost, right? And I don't know if you've ever been lost before. You know, I was lost in Meyer in Disney World like 600 times. You know, you just <laughs> walk away from your parents and they're going crazy looking for you. Um, I'm sure some of you have done that before. But the funny thing about this story is, is that Jesus himself is actually not lost, right? You know, we can get lost when we're kids. He's lost to, Jesus, he's lost to Joseph and Mary. They think he's lost. But Jesus knows exactly where he is, and he is not lost, and he knows exactly what he's doing. So he's a very smart 12-year-old. You know, I don't want you guys to run away from your parents, so don't do that. Um, so Jesus... At a very early age, he hears the voice of his father, right? And so this is also in the Old Testament, same thing in the Old Testament. Um, the priest Samuel heard God's voice at age 12, and God was calling him and speaking to him even at a very young age. And so Jesus, at 12 years old, is on a mission. You know, imagine Jesus 12, maybe some of you are on 12. Um, and so... We have to understand a little bit, a few things about this. So first, they go up to Passover. So the Holy Family is a good family. They celebrate all the feast days of Israel, just like us as Catholics, we have so many feast days. The Jewish faith had many feast days, and Passover was their, one of their big feast days. And so tradition holds that at some point, because Jesus is human and divine, Jesus is learning who he is. He knows... He sees God the Father, but he's coming to learn and understand and grow just like, a hum like, just like a regular person. So Jesus has to discover, I'm the son, maybe he knows, automatically he knows that he's the son of God, he always knows that, but what God the Father's plan for him is, like, what does God want me to do? What's his will? So Jesus himself has to discover, well, what is the will of God for me? And so a lot of scholars believe that because Jesus turned 12, 
he's able to enter into the temple in Jerusalem at this age, and he's able to practice his faith as a man. And so, and so in that time, some believe that when they were killing the lambs for the Passover, Jesus is beginning the, for the first time to realize he is the Lamb of God himself. So imagine them killing the lambs for the sins of the people, and then Jesus realizes by revelation by God, I am the Lamb that's going to die for the world. So we don't know exactly if this is the moment, but some scholars believe this is the moment where Jesus really discovers a deeper plan for him. The other thing amazing about Jesus in this moment is it says that he's asking them questions, and Jesus is actually teaching the scribes and the Pharisees. So as much as you 12-year-olds sometimes you like to teach your parents, I don't recommend that, you know, probably not to teach your parents a lesson or anything, but Jesus is actually teaching at 12 because it says he's sitting. To say that he's sitting is a, a position a teacher would take and asking them questions is the same thing that Jesus does in the, later on as he's older, is actually a form of teaching. And they were all amazed at him. How does this little boy know the Torah? How does he know the scriptures? How does he know all of this stuff, right? And so I'd like to think that Jesus had a specific plan from the Father, even though it doesn't tell us, is he's preparing a way for himself, that he's coming and he's preparing them for his own coming and his own ministry as he gets older. And so the point of what I want us to reflect on is two things, two things for this new coming year, just so we can relate to it today. Is that you can see how when Mary and Joseph, they find Jesus, they ask him, why have you done this to us? And he basically says, well, why have you sought me? Why are you looking for me? And he says to them, that's the first words recorded of Jesus speaking in the scriptures, like basically, why are you looking for me? And he's like, do you not know that I am in my father's house? And so first, Jesus is obedient to her, obedient to who before he's obedient to his parents? He's always obedient to God the Father first. Did you not know that I am in my father's house doing my father's will? So first, more important than anything this new year, this new year that's here already, what is the most important thing? God first, always, above mother, father, brother, sister, anyone. God is always first. And so sometimes our priorities in life are work first, work is first, making money is first, taking care of the kids is first, taking care of your spouse is first. But really, God has to be the center of the... He is first, and that's what Jesus is showing us. God the Father is first, and all these things are important, and we need to do them. But if we forget God, we can't be doing any of these things well. They're only... We're not doing them well at all. And so that's the first thing I want us to learn from it. The other one is, you can see also how he's obedient to Joseph and Mary, it says that he submitted themselves to them. So obedience is one of the key ways we grow in holiness. Sometimes obedience sounds like a bad word. I don't know why we always make it sometimes seem like today, like being obedient, oh, that's bad, too many rules, I gotta listen. But in fact, one of the main reasons why God the Father is so pleased with Jesus is because of his endless obedience. And so it's the same thing for us, for us to be pleasing to God, is to hear his word and to be, be obedient to it. And so one example of this is in the scripture, all the religious things that people do sometimes in the Old Testament are never pleasing to God without obedience. All the sacrifices, the sacrifice of the lamb, all of these things, are only pleasing to God if the people's hearts are being faithful. So whenever we come to Mass, we have to understand that we need to be cleansed of our sins, make a full commitment to Jesus, and then our prayer becomes more fruitful, more beautiful, more effective. If I'm just living in sin as a priest every day, and I'm not obedient to Jesus, and faithful to Jesus, then all the religious things are 
just rituals that become empty and powerless and they don't make fruit. They don't produce fruit. And so it's very important this year, how can we grow in hearing the voice of God so we can be obedient? So first thing, just some practical advice. What I was taught in seminary always was just a few like little simple things to help us grow in obedience. So let's say you have a goal this new year. You want to read the Bible. So a good thing to do is before you go to sleep, open up your Bible. You don't have to read it yet. I mean, if you have time, read it, obviously. But you don't have to read it yet. Put it on your nightstand. Open it up to the page that you want to read in the morning and have it all laid out and say, okay, I don't have time right now, but I'm going to lay it all out so I'm getting ready to do the next thing for the next day. So same thing with any other thing. For example, if you know that you're prone to staying up late and playing video games and watching TV all night, of course your prayer life the next day is going to be like, okay, I didn't pray today, I woke up half awake, half asleep, and I didn't focus. So just taking, planning the day before, the night before, what you're going to do the next day. And so that will really help us to grow in our prayer life because sometimes it's very easy. People tell me, Abuna, I don't pray, or I pray right before I go to bed. But really, prayer has to be something more than we just pray right before we go to sleep. I prayed an hour, Father, and in Hail Mary. That's good for if we're just kids. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't pray like pray before we go to sleep. But we really, to hear the voice of God and to do His will, we have to really plan our prayer life this year. We can't just, you know, set empty goals and not make plans. So that's just one example of something we can do. Another thing I, I recommend is Bible in a Year. So we're starting a new year, and Father Mike Schmitz has an amazing podcast where he goes through the entire Bible in one year, and he explains parts of the Bible. That's a really good thing a lot of Catholics are doing. And so I really recommend finding a way to try to read the whole Bible this year. And so that's my own goal for myself this year, is to read the whole Bible at least once. I should be reading the Bible as a priest. If I'm not reading the Bible, you know, we're in danger. We're all in danger here. Um... <laughs> So that's a huge goal. I have to be reading the scripture. You can't just, you know, doing whatever. So that's a goal of mine. So I just encourage you to be thinking this new year, what are you going to be doing? And take it seriously. And if you fall out of your goals, go back to your goals. That uh, visiting Jesus in the, in the Eucharist. You know, the main thing today also when Jesus was saying, did you not know that I'm in my Father's house? We're looking for joy and happiness everywhere else except the Eucharist. When Jesus is saying, I'm right here. You've been looking for me, I'm here, right? And so a lot of times people are looking for happiness and peace and joy, and this chapel is empty. I, will, I kid you not, even though it's busy on some days at night and here and there, but really if you think about it, our adoration chapel is empty. It should be filled with people all the time praying before the Eucharist. We only have 10 churches in Michigan, and if you really think about it, I'm always shocked, like, this is the only main adoration site, maybe St. Joseph too. they have two, you could, not every Catholic church has an adoration chapel like this, and it's empty. It's empty in the morning, it's empty, there's nobody praying in front of the Eucharist all the time, maybe Tuesdays because we expose the Eucharist from, from 9 to 11, we have the Eucharist exposed on Tuesdays if you didn't know that, but praying before the Eucharist is so life transformative. In fact, Bishop Francis has declared this year the year of the Eucharist. So every first Thursday, we're going to be having Eucharistic adoration from 5.30 to 6.30, and we're going to do a meditation during the Holy Eucharist. So I really encourage reading the Bible and praying in front of the Eucharist. And that is life transformative for us this year. So I really just encourage us to do that and to thank Jesus for the many graces and gifts he's given us this year, and may he continue to bless you this new year. Amen.